Hi, my name is John Lindemann, and I'm one of the elders here at Creekside Bible Church. It is so good to see all of you at one time. I usually come to the second service, so I usually I, I miss out on the on the beautiful faces of the first service. So it, it is a true pleasure of mine to be here and to welcome you this morning. But it is my great pleasure to have us turn to the Word of God. If you would turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 22, uh, we'll start at verse 16, or on the screen to my left and to my right. And the Word of God says, If any man entices a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he should surely pay the pride the bride price for her to be his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money according to the bride price of virgins. You shall not permit a sorcerer to live. Whoever lies with an animal shall surely be put to death. He who sacrifices to any god except to the Lord only, he shall be utterly destroyed. You shall neither mistreat a stranger nor oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If you afflict them in any way and they cry out at all to me, I surely will hear their cry and my wrath will become that and I will kill you with a sword and your wives will be widows and your, your children fatherless. Blessed is the reading of God's word. And before we go and begin the study of the word of God, let's go to the God of the word. Let's pray. Our dearest and only Heavenly Father, teach us to be more like you, faithful and true, pure and undefiled, just and justifying a friend to strangers, the rescuer of the captive. Teach us to pity and care for the less fortunate, to trust you for our prosperity without taking advantage of those that we could use to get ourselves ahead. You gave us your firstborn, and indeed we are heirs of every good thing in your hand. Help us to respond by giving you the very best we have knowing our greatest credits are debits in your economy and our righteousness is as filthy rags. We rejoice in your word. We seek to follow your example. We stand in your grace, for we have no other choice. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to start today by getting the uncomfortable topic out of the way, having made sure the kiddos are dismissed to Itty Bitty Church. Our passage today opens with a clear discussion on God's views of extramarital sex. Now, we are, we are much more comfortable, I think, uh, talking in terms of, of premarital sex, right? Because we all agree that our kids shouldn't be engaging in marital activities until they're married. And we all agree that affairs are way out of bounds. But God's expectation is far broader than that. And far too many of us turn a blind eye to what adults do once their marriage ends and they begin dating again. But God's word here in Exodus 22 and elsewhere is quite clear. God has put man and woman together in the holy bonds of marriage, and it is only within those confines that God is delighted in the exercise of our marital activities. And so we go on to the word as given to us in Exodus 22, 16, and 17. Please note, this is not addressing instances of rape or incest. The term that New King James uses is seduces. The, the Greek is, is very particular that this is a willing partnership in adultery. So the, the, scenarios, uh, the scenario's closest modern parallel is the dating relationship. Um, and it, within the dating relationship, and according to God's law, um, th this passage is addressing those who are not married behaving as if they are. 
And according to God's law, as given in Exodus 22, 16, those who engage in marital relations while not married are to become married. Now, I've been asked many times in my career, are you willing to marry people who are living together? My answer has always been a very qualified yes. I believe, and the Bible clearly teaches, that sexual relations outside the marriage covenant is outside of the will of God. It is sin. And to actively participate in ending sin and setting people on a course that pleases God is not only my responsibility, but it is my pleasure. And so for that reason, I would certainly encourage those who are living together unmarried to become married, and I will gladly participate in that. However, it is not enough to simply get the piece of paper or go through the motions because dealing with sin involves a change of heart and a change of direction. It is the literal definition of repentance. And so in order for me to consider marrying a couple who are living together or even practicing the marital arts outside of marriage while living mostly apart, I must always ask the couple to separate, to cease their sexual activities and to institute strict and transparent accountability to prove their repentance. If the couple refuses to take these steps of repentance, then the pastor, me, I believe must refuse to endorse the marriage because it's founded upon a flagrant disregard for God's intention and blueprint for that marriage. I know what God says, but I'm not going to stop until I want to stop, and I don't want to stop, so we're just going to keep going, and you have to throw your endorsement on it. No, we don't treat any sin that way. We cannot expect a God-fearing, Bible-believing pastor to perform a marriage for those who are flaunting God's design by acting married in a sexual sense when they are not married, any more than we can allow such a God-fearing, Bible-believing pastor to perform a marriage between same-sex couples, or as we'll very briefly deal with in a couple of verses, a person and an animal. If somebody were to come to me and say, hey, I really love my dog, I'd say, I I get that, I got a dog, Milo, he's great. No, I mean, I really love my doggy. Okay, I want to marry my dog. Not in this church. You know what I mean? Such marriages are inconsistent with the clear word of God, and so is a marriage that makes light of the prohibition against sex outside of marriage, and repentance in both cases is an absolute biblical mandate. Well, that's a fun way to start a sermon. Let's get back into the passage, because the question becomes, am I actually suggesting that sex, in this modern day and age, 2022 AD, is this bald guy with the microphone up there actually suggesting that sex should only occur within a marriage and that those who engage in such activities outside of marriage should be forced to marry. No, I am not suggesting it. God is commanding it. If a man entices a virgin with who, uh, who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall surely pay the bride price for her to be his wife. What if they don't get married? That's a costly error and one that implies a divorce. This is addressed in verse 17. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money according to the bride price of virgins, which is spelled out in other Levitical laws. And we're not going to get into the Hebrew laws of divorce and marriage and and all of that. Instead, we're just going to simply take the passage at its face value where God says, look, if you want to act married, be married. And if there's a reason you cannot be married or will not be married then it is the same as a divorce. Now, what does God think of divorces? Let me, let me back that up. We, don't, we know God does not uh, approve of divorce. What about, don't, don't answer this out loud, but I know there are divorced people in this group right now. Was that fun? Did you enjoy it? Did you raise your kids and say, boy, I really hope that you can go through the disillusion of a marriage? It was a hoot. I've never met anyone who did not say, oh, I hope my children, my grandchildren never have to go through the pain that I have endured as my marriage fell apart. For whatever reason, nobody enjoys a divorce. Yet God says that when we engage in sexual activity outside of marriage, if it does not then turn to marriage, it is equal to a divorce. And I will tell you, the pain, the pain of giving yourself And taking it back, it is not worth it. It will never be worth it. This runs so contrary to modern life and expectations. And I know many among us agree entirely with this principle. 
in, in principle. But how many of us tolerate this behavior in our entertainment or our friendships or our families? Sex has become a casual pastime, a recreational activity, a rite of passage instead of the sacred physical bond that completes the joining of two into one. In Genesis 2.24, God tells us that from the beginning, his intention was for married couples to be united in physical as well as emotional, familial, economic, and reproductive unity. Exodus 22 emphasizes the fact that when a couple unites with each other in a sexual way, they are forever as one flesh. So the question for us, of course, is what does this mean in today's culture? Because we are not living in roughly 1300 B.C., We are not wandering the desert with Moses in a a pillar of smoke and fire. So what does it mean in today's culture? The same thing it meant in theirs. Sex is intended for marriage, period. Now, having said that, let me say this. Put your pens down and give me your eyes and your ears because what I'm about to say, I believe with all my heart, to come from the mouth and the heart of God himself. There is no sin he can not forgive. There is no way to out-naughty his grace. And if you have traveled down this road or any other road of sin, you are not ruined because my God is the one who remakes all those who give ourselves to him. So hear me now. This is an error, a mistake that many, many people make. But the cross is bigger than the bedroom. And forever and ever it must be declared, grace is sufficient. Amen? Anybody here really enjoying the news coming out of the stock market lately? Some of you retired folks, you're thinking, yeah, this is, this is just what I signed up for, right? Imagine if somebody you loved and cared about came and said, hey, you know, we're, we're looking to invest in this company. It's, it's been around you know, forever and it's never made a profit. The founder of the original company this one broke off from has guaranteed that we will lose every penny we put in and we will come out the other side broken, bitter, and damaged. So how much do you think I should invest? Uh, none right? None, nothing, nada, please don't. To invest so much emotional and physical currency into a temporary relationship or one that flaunts God's clear design is foolish. So thus we as Christians must stand and defend marriage, not just against activist judges or the woke crowd or the LGBTQ plus advocates, but against all the assaults of Satan. We have to encourage our children to hold sex as sacred. We have to model the sanctity of marriage to our children. Divorce, affairs, sex outside of marriage after divorce, and proper displays of affection towards the spouse that we have. These are things we must model to our children. Nothing will get my daughters out of the room faster than asking them to do a chore or if I give their mom a kiss. Ew, they're gone. But there is no doubt in either of my daughter's minds that their parents love each other and are committed to one another. And it may be gross and you old people love, but it is love and they have no doubt of it. Proper affection towards your spouse at every age is critical. We have to raise our level of expectation and our standards for ourselves and our loved ones. We need to watch what movies and TVs we watch. We shouldn't accept cohabitation. We should teach our children the truth. We have to be as vocal as the other side. And believe me, they're being told a thousand times a day that it's just recreation. It's fun. It's harmless. We cannot take the role of sex lightly because God certainly does not. By the way, more bad news, at least for about half the crowd. The responsibility for keeping the relationship moving in a godly direction is shared, but the weight of leadership, rightly so, is on the man says, if a man seduces a virgin, he must pay the bride price and she shall be his wife. And in verse 17, he shall pay. Now, this passage does not exonerate the woman, 
nor does it place the blame solely on the man. It places the authority and therefore the accountability square on the male's shoulders. Throughout the Bible, men are commanded to lead and to cherish our women, to love them as Jesus loved his church, not using us for his own pleasure, but for the glory of God. And in today's passage, the man is commanded to take responsibility for his sexual activities. Even though the woman in this scenario is a willing participant, it is the man's responsibility to protect them both from sin and to lead her into right standing with God. We as men must take our responsibility towards women seriously. And I believe we are held responsible by God for every interaction we have with women, whether they are our spouses or the the checkout girl at Walmart. Each and every contact men have with women should result in them drawing nearer to God living more in line with his will for their lives and as far as we are able to allow them to live without regrets. That's our job. This is the expectation of God and he holds us so accountable. His word tells us to treat even our dating relationships as sacred. Now before we move on, let me say this to the ladies. You cannot expect to stand before God and say, yeah, well, you know, he didn't take responsibility, so (laughs) I just went with it. You have responsibility for yourself. Keep your standards high you are worth far more than you think you are. And even if you think you're worth an awful lot, it pales in comparison to the value that your creator has put on you. Now, you think that was uncomfortable? Let's deal with verse 19. Few of us deal with the topic of sex with animals on a regular basis. We all know this passage and every other line in this book, though, has meaning for us, right? The question is, is this application really important enough for me to address it from the pulpit? Couldn't we just please skip Exodus 22, 19? I say, I wish. But the answer is yes, it is important enough to deal with from the pulpit. And here's why. The marriage covenant is under attack from all sides. The casual sex mentality, homosexual marriage advocates, cohabitation promoters, and the media that has declared several times that marriage is outdated or even dead. And if we allow, and we already have, if we allow marriage to be redefined, what revision is next? Elja Rita Berliner Mauer, whose last name means Berlin Wall, was married to the Berlin Wall for more than 30 years though she now considers herself a widow because the, destro- the wall was destroyed in 1989. She loved the Berlin Wall. She has written all kinds of stories about how beautiful that wall is. And so she married the Berlin Wall somewhere in the late 50s or 60s. I don't know, but she considers herself married, though she is a widow. A San Francisco woman, Erica Latour Eiffel, had a ceremony with friends in 2007 in which she married the Eiffel Tower. And she has sued to have that marriage legally recognized. And the only thing that stopped her was that the husband could not appear in court. I'm not making this up. Amy W. didn't give her last name, can't imagine why. At the time of writing of this article a few years ago, she was 32 years old. She had been in relationships with models of spacecraft with the Twin Towers, a church organ, the banister on her stairs, but her main lover is a fairground ride at the local amusement park near her home in New York State, and she is seeking a legal marriage to the amusement park ride, ladies and gentlemen. She really likes her roller coaster. How long will it be before there's a successful lawsuit to demand the right to marry animals or objects or even ideas? And so here's the application for verse 19. God invented marriage, he defined marriage, and he is jealously passionate about its sanctity, and he will not bless those who abuse the marriage covenant with anybody or anything. Now, we're going to move very quickly ahead here. I know that between uh, announcements and and communion, uh, we're running a little late today, but I don't have a second service or Sunday school to get to, so you're kind of at my mercy, but I will move quickly here. Jump back up to verse 18, which we're going to deal with collectively with verse 20. You shall not permit a sorceress to live. And then verse 20, he who sacrifices to any God except to the Lord only, he shall be utterly destroyed. And so we deal with sorcery and sacrificing to false gods, little g, with quotation marks, because there is one God and only one God. 
Now, as far as sorcerers or sorceresses, don't get too caught up in the gender of the word in Scripture. It, it says sorceress. The concept is gender neutral. Those who practice sorcery are to be put to death. But what constitutes sorcery? Well, I had a whole long thing, and I said, well, I'm not going to have time for that. So let me just boil it down for you. Anything that calls upon creation in the place of the Creator, whether that's tapping into the forces of darkness or looking to the stars or zodiac signs or palm reading, sorcery is an affront to God. Sorcery is also very closely related to idolatry, which is why it's covered so closely together with sacrificing the false gods. And sorcery, by the way, is all around us. You think, well, I don't know any sorcerers. Know anybody who follows their horoscope? You ever meet somebody and they find out your birthday, they're like, oh, you're a Leo. No, I'm James. Leo's my cousin. I got a cousin, Leo. Big guy. Harry Potter and other popular books that promote sorcery and witchcraft. Psychics and fortune tellers. There's a psychic here in, in, in the area. Big banner outside their house. But you know what I've noticed? That house never, ever turns its lights off. Go by in the daytime, the outside lights are on. Go by at night, the, the, the outside lights are on. And I have a theory about this. I imagine that those living in that house and practicing psychic readings are terrified of the dark because they know what lives there. Nothing to mess around with. The occult, the Wiccan church, media and TV shows like Medium and The Ghost Whisperer and Paranormal Detectives and all those things that celebrate these unseen forces in a way that is inconsistent with the word of God. These are the things we must avoid. We must not open ourselves up to such influences. It's a dangerous road and a slap in the face to the only one who knows the future or can control nature. By the way, I can throw Ouija boards in there too. That's not all that popular anymore, but it used to be. Someone has to bust out the Ouija board, bust them in the head with it and run because you don't have any business playing with those things. Oh, it's harmless at first because Satan's too smart. He'll get you hooked. False religion. Those who sacrifice to any God other than Jehovah must be put to death because this too is an affront to God. His punishment for idolatry is swift and clear. Kill him! It's swift and it's clear, but is it, is it fair? Well, let me, let me throw this out at you. Yes, it's very fair. Because these people want so badly to avoid God and to interact with demons and false gods, so God commands us to arrange their heart's desire, an eternity away from God with the demons and the false gods that they worship. So it's really just giving them what they ask for, which is fair and open-minded to me, but let's get real here. What about today? <laughs> Am I preaching to 140 people or so who have a job to go out and kill every neighbor that doesn't believe exactly what we do? Is the death penalty still in effect for those who worship Allah or Buddha or the pantheon of Hindu gods or who practice no religion but humanism? Is the death penalty still in effect for those people? I ought to take a vote right now, but I don't want to embarrass you. The answer is yes. Because Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. But we can't stop there, Christians. Don't ever quote Romans 6.23a and stop. The wages of sin is death. But, here comes the holy however. But, the gift of God is eternal life through whatever God you want to worship. Don't ever preach that verse either. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not through Buddha, not through Allah, not through any of the Hindu gods, not through humanism, not through self-esteem. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. What happens when we give ourselves to Christ? There's a great hymn. I wish I had thought about it. I would have had Hannah play it. I could probably throw it at Donna and she'd hop up here and play it from memory. I'm not going to do that. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Know that one? It's right out, of the, right out of Paul's writings. When we come to Christ, the old man dies. So yes, Christians, get out there and kill everyone who worships a false god, but not in the physical sense. 
please. Get out there and crucify them with Christ. Bring them the gospel. Let the old them perish and let them become a new creation. Now, back to this Romans 6.23. If they don't repent, understand that his punishment is meted out by God at the judgment throat of Christ. And it is our goal and our duty and our responsibility to preach the gospel to these individuals so that by God's grace we might deliver some from the certain and eternal death of false religion. Moving ahead to our treatment of foreigners. Do not mistreat mistreat or oppress a foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. Verse 21. Some churches, some churches I have been involved in, and if I'm honest, Squaw Creek Baptist Church, six years ago, about six years and uh, 12 days ago, when I came to be your pastor, we were within eyesight of this. We were eyeing this as a destination, but we swiftly... Uh, came to our senses. But there are some churches who have an unofficial us for no more lock the door motto in place, right? They have their holy huddle and they don't want anybody else in. And in churches such as these, there's no room for anyone who's different, no place for anyone from the outside, no consideration taken as to how those outside the inner circle are communicated with or included or pursued. In fact, there is no pursuit of outsiders. Most of the time they say, well, the door is open. If they want to come in badly enough, they'll find a way. But that's not evangelism. That's not an evangelical mindset. It is this type of heart that the Lord is addressing here. We're not talking, in this passage, we are not talking about border walls or the repeal or implementation of Title 42 or legal versus illegal immigration. Forget all of that. Throw your politics out the window and come to the Word of God because I believe that God is dealing with those who think they belong because of their heritage or their history and those who do not belong because of their newness or their station in life. I belong here because I've been here a long time. My heritage makes me special and I will tell you if you are good enough to get into my little club. I have harsh words I will keep to myself. Is there room in the body of Christ for people who exclude those who are a little different? No. I'm not talking about just welcoming anyone and anything into our worship services. We just talked about idolatry. There's no room for heresy. There's no room for false teaching. But when we have the opportunity to share the love of Christ with others, we have the responsibility to do it as well. And sometimes the greatest thing we can do is to have a neighbor over for supper or to take a new family a plate of cookies or to throw a ball around with a kid down the street who moved there when mom and dad split up. Or maybe one of the greatest things we can do for the kingdom is to avoid talking to the people we've known for years and concentrate our Sunday morning conversation on those we don't know. Because there's plenty of time on Tuesday to call your BFF. But you've only got a few minutes before and after the service to connect with newcomers and with other generations, and with former rivals with whom the Lord is calling for peace. So prioritize those things in our time together. God's command to treat foreigners well has two significant things we have to take notice of. Number one, God accompanies this command with a reminder. We are to do this because you were once in, your sh- in their shoes. And the fact is, we've all been new to something sometime, and if we're not loved, we didn't last very long. And if you're still here after a long time, it's because you found what we found when we came here. This is a family, and we love one another, thick and thin, up and down, sin and obedience. We stick together because we are a family, and I love this church. And I want others to fall in love with our Savior because they come to know our, His family. Number two thing. Immediately following this command is another one that is undeniably connected. We are to give mercy to those who are different, foreigners or outcasts. In this way, we not only show the love of Jesus, we build our community. God says, do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will be aroused and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives will become widows and your children fatherless. I say to you, God, take seriously how we treat those who may not quite be like us who may not quite fit in, who may be a little odd and a little different. And we're going to talk about this more as we move ahead in this chapter, but for now, 
in regards to those who join our community, let's remind ourselves of the words of the Apostle Peter, who said, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Today's passage continues God's instructions to take personal responsibility for our decisions and our actions. In the area of sex, we are to treat it as a sacred aspect of marriage and take responsibility for our decisions regarding abstaining, participating, or endorsing such behavior. In the case of idolatry, we must set our standards high and keep ourselves from contaminating our relationship with God by the use of mediums or psychics or fortune tellers or astrologers or the occult. To look to the created for the things only the creator can give is reprehensible. Our responsibility towards those who are not like us is to share the love of Jesus through words, actions, and invitations. Romans 5.8 points out just how incredibly different we once were from Christ. But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now that's very, very different, isn't it? But notice the Bible doesn't say God demonstrated. God demonstrates. It is an ongoing act. God is still demonstrating his love for us that even though we were completely, totally, 100% different from Jesus Christ, having been corrupted by sin throughout every aspect of our existence, Jesus Christ came and died for us. We were as foreign to God as we could be. We were far more foreign than we could ever be to another human being regardless of country or creed. And that's the bad news. Not that God demonstrates his love for us by dying for us, but that we by nature and by choice are separated from God and we cannot bridge the gap on our own. That's the bad news. Here, Christians, is the good news. For he, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Are you ready for the really, really, really good news? We could not have been more different. And now in the eyes of God, those who have come to faith in Christ are indistinguishable from him. God cannot tell the difference between a believer like me with all my sins, all my history, all my stupidity, and the dumb things I haven't even gotten a chance to do yet, but I will. He cannot tell the difference between me and Jesus Christ, his perfect and flawless eternal son we who were strangers have been made sons and daughters and the offer stands for all who hear it come to christ be no more a foreigner nor more a stranger but a child of the most high god forsaking the worthless false gods of this world embracing a plan for your life that leaves us without regret without the emptiness bitterness or brokenness that comes from pursuing the world's plan Christianity is not a crutch for the lame. It is life for the dead. And it is a difficult calling, but it's worth every sacrifice because the one who sacrificed the most calls us to be like him, seated in the presence of God forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for providing a better way than the world has to offer. May we follow it faithfully. May we always remember the grace in which we stand that has overcome every error, patched every crack, unloaded every bit of baggage and taken away our shame. Forgive us for every time we look to the created to find what only you, the creator, can provide. Help us to show kindness to the stranger, particularly within the church, for we were once strangers far from you, and now we find ourselves strangers far from the world in which we live. May we proclaim the gospel with each breath until we are finally finally and eternally united with you in heaven. It is in your holy name that we pray. Amen.